Live. Cool. All right. It sounds like we're live. Um, good evening. Um, Dr. Richard Yu, superintendent here at Frontier. And you can't see him, but in the room right now is our exec team. Uh, Will Thiel, our director of finance. Colleen Dugan, our assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction. And Myra Pinker, our assistant superintendent for personnel and human resources. So before I get to the many questions you all sent us, um, and I appreciate all the questions, we're going to try to get through as many as we possibly can. Um, I just want to acknowledge the, the challenging time we're in. Since uh, the, the pandemic hit um, back in February, January, and us closing schools in March, um, it's been a challenging time for everybody. Um, parents, um, there's grandparents that haven't seen their grandchildren, um, haven't been allowed to travel, our normal routines are no longer normal. And one thing we're trying to do is get back to some normalcy. And school is a big component of that normalcy. Um, and we have a lot of great people working to make that happen. Um, they've been working around the clock, uh, behind the scenes, uh, making things happen and working in every contingency as you know, as the rules change, as the guidelines change uh, from Albany and, and uh, DC. And I'd like to thank you know the reopening committee with over 100 people on the reopening committee spending their valuable time to do so, especially our co-chairs, co uh, Mrs. Mikowski, Mr. Sikorsky, um, who, have, who have taken this role on uh, along with our, as our safety committee chairs and, and have run with it and just done unbelievable work with it. And the work isn't stopping. Um, it's going to continue until you know, this pandemic goes, goes away and whatever that may look like. Uh, I got to thank my exec team, you know, they're sitting here, um, but they're the ones, you know, we lean on that I lean on um, to help us figure out what's the best thing to do for all of our Falcons. Um, you know, our principals and admin, they want questions just as much as you do. We all want answers to those questions. And uh, the tough part about it is Things keep changing so much, as you can see, they're happening in other states. But luckily, New York's in a pretty good spot, um, and you see other districts changing their plans. Um, hopefully, we can uh, get going and get hybrid and and um, lock in and maybe get back to full in, in the near future. I got to also thank our union stakeholders. We had a two-hour meeting just today uh, with you know members of the FCA, our civil service group, the FCTA, our teachers union. Um, the FCRNA, which are our nurses that are on the front lines of helping make sure our return to school is safe and our manager are confidential. Um, you know, a two hour meeting on a Wednesday afternoon trying to figure out all the answers to all the world's problems at this point um, is, is pretty impressive. And then, um, you know, we want to give you as many answers tonight. Um, honestly, we're not going to have all the answers because there's going to be things that we're going to be flexible with as we go forward and some of the answers many people won't like as we do find what those answers are um, but you know our world keeps changing on a daily basis and we've just got to be ready to uh, change with it but here at frontier we're fully committed to opening with a hybrid model and if things work well we can keep numbers down in our region and and do those pieces that are so critical for the health and safety and well-being of our uh, our students and our community the sooner we can go back to everyday learning the better and that's what my hope is. So let's start diving into some of these questions. Um, I'm not going to read every single one because there's a lot, but sat through it. I've read every single one and basically broke them into 35 different categories. So we'll start going through these. And if you miss something, maybe you have to get a snack or you know the Amazon package shows up or something like that. And you miss one. This is being recorded. So you can watch it anytime. Um, share it with whoever needs to share it once this is over with. And uh, we'll have some follow-up forums on Sunday um, at 1 o'clock and then Monday at 9 a.m. just so it meets everybody's kind of schedules to do so. Um, so I think the biggest first question, when does the school year start? We are scheduled to open in a hybrid opening on the 9th, which is a Wednesday. So that will actually, we're going to change the calendars um, so this is one of the questions that comes up with holidays, like Columbus Day being on a Monday and those things. So we'll put out a calendar specifically saying which day is cohort one, which day is cohort two, or A and B, which are the remote learning days mostly are going to be on Wednesday. Any conference days we have, any um, holidays we have, we're going to make those the remote learning days so that students aren't in attendance and losing any days. 
but we are scheduled to open on the 9th of September. So we're less than a month away. Um, actually, I'm, yeah, less than a month away, four weeks from today. Um, so one question I got was why the hybrid? Um, well, looking at it, the reopening committee did a great, great job looking at all these pieces. But there's two things we had to consider as Frontier is do we have enough space to do the social distancing that we need to do six feet uh, for all of our classrooms and such? And do we have enough staff capacity? Um, there, you know, I, I've been given a couple examples of a neighboring school um, that we may compete with on the field and in the, in the classroom. And uh, why can they go fully? Well, each school is different. They have positive and negatives to every school district. Um, I think the, the people we have in our district is, is what set us, sets us apart. But for a district like our neighbors in Maroon, um, we have the same enrollment. They have $20 million more in funding uh, from their tax base and such. Our taxes are among the lowest, I think the lowest in Erie County. Um, and that's not because we want them to be there. They've just been there historically and have been kept there. And with the tax cap now, it's impossible to catch up. Um, you know, you're looking at a 50% tax increase if you want to catch up to um, some of the similar schools uh, like the Maroon over there. Um, we also have, you know, schools that announced in the last 24 hours that are going full virtual to start the school year. The great thing we'll able, we're able to do is provide a virtual option for all parents. So if they choose to have their kids work virtually, there will be asynchronous, which means learning that's not at the same time and synchronous learning which means you know classes working together all at the same time online um, going on we'll have teachers dedicated specifically for those classes uh, that are full virtual so we have the option to do so and if we have enough students that decide to do the virtual option uh, we can then dive into maybe more students coming in on an everyday basis um, but we have to have the space to do so so we can't bring everybody back to our buildings and we have to have the staffing capacity to do so. If we had another $20 million, we could have the staff to do so. Um, but those are the two challenges we've got to meet to do whatever model we could do. And hybrid is the one that we can definitely do while also offering a virtual option. We are going to be doing some everyday learning and I'll get into that question a little bit later on. Um, another question came up about, well, if we needed the extra funding, why didn't we just stop all the capital projects? And I want to make sure that people understand what capital funding looks like. It's a very separate pot. It's building aid. So when we do a capital project, we get aid from the state specifically categorized as building aid. That has to go to debt that is paid off as part of the capital project. Because when we do a capital project, we take out a loan. And you know, a recent loan that we took out was you know less than a half percent. So those kind of pieces, that building aid pays that loan that the district takes on uh, as debt service. The aid that we use um, to, you know, to teach our students for learning for all the other programs, that comes from, from foundation aid and our taxes. So those things are very separate. We could stop the capital projects, but it's not gonna make a change in the funding that we have available for our student programs. Um, they're totally different sources, and that's just how New York State does it. They've done it that way for a very long time. So we don't see that changing um, ever. Um, so one of the questions I got, let's move on to the next set. Um, had somebody write in, and this is one that many people asked about, you know, in classroom settings, how many students will be allowed in each classroom? Um, so we've gone to all the classrooms. Right now, our awesome custodial staff, our facilities crew is going through removing extra furniture and things that we can't use like big tables, um, extra bookshelves that take up space, and we can put 12 to 14 desks in the typical elementary classroom. So we're looking at, you know, if our typical class size is 24 to 22 students, you split it in half, we have room to, to put 12 to 14 students in each classroom. So what the final number is gonna look like will depend on how many students and their parents select virtual learning. So that will, you know, lessen the number of sizes, but it could also allow us to do more everyday learning for, for quite a few of our students. Um, and there's a question on there about cleaning. I'll get to that later. All the precautions we're taking and all the steps our wonderful facility crew is doing. So another question, and there was quite a few just on this topic. Um, so why the hybrid model that 
we chose. So this is the wonderful little chart you may have seen. There's a little bit of changes to this chart, and I'll explain those in a second and why those changes occurred. Um, but there is two ways to go. Most school districts in our area and, and across the state are using a remote day on Wednesday. Some have said it's a deep cleaning day, when in reality, we're cleaning every day. We're cleaning during the day. So there's not a sanitation issue from one group of students coming in on Monday and another group or the same group coming in on a Tuesday. Cleaning is happening every day um, throughout. We're actually ha hiring extra cleaners, extending hours to our uh, many to our current cleaners. So we have more people on staff during the day and after hours to do everything we got to do to make our environment as safe as, as safe as we can. Um, so why did we choose a cohort one on Monday and Thursday, cohort two or, or group B on Tuesday and Friday, and a remote on Wednesday, instead of doing two, uh, one group on Monday, Tuesday, and the next group on Thursday, Friday. The reason really, I can see the reasons why having them back to back. Our biggest concern was if a student came in on a Monday, or excuse me, if they were Monday, Tuesday, and that student left on a Tuesday, we wouldn't see them again until the following Monday. That's six days. Um, and I do understand the stress it does put on families, um, but we're, we're very split on this. Um, the surveys have come back multiple ways and the committee came up with both and couldn't come to any kind of full agreement. It's split. It's split across districts in our area. Um, I would say the higher portion of them are using the, the hybrid model we're using. Um, but there's also districts doing the A, A or cohort one on two days in a row, remote on Wednesday, and then the two, the cohort two or the two Bs on Thursday, Friday. Um, and one thing that we were able to do, um, you know, we work with Erie One BOCES. We're Erie One BOCES um, school district. We have a ton of kids um, that use BOCES programs and not just CTE. There's a, there's a lot of great programs uh, that Erie One provides that you know, we just couldn't do because of the scale of what they're able to do. And we've received a number of questions on, on BOCES itself. So originally our high school model, the one that's online right now, um, has the ninth through 12th graders going every other day. So A, B, A, B, A, B, or this cohort, second cohort, first cohort, second cohort. Well, BOCES, seeing what all the other districts are doing, we originally scheduled our high school 9-12 to follow the BOCES model. So our students were going every other day with any BOCES students going on the A day. Well, BOCES uh, did a you know, great leadership over there uh, with Dr. Fusco and Mike Capuana. They've done a great job and they, they've asked all of us what we were doing and they saw what we were all doing. We did a survey to see what each district is planning at the, at the high school level specifically. And now we're able to make our schedule, um, our AB remote AB, model consistent pre-k 12. so pre k is in there this is the updated sheet don't worry about taking a screenshot we'll get it posted um, tomorrow morning but you don't see any cohort three here anymore because everybody's going to either be cohort one or cohort two um, from what i've been told um, our students that go to boces uh, will be on a days or cohort one days and we'll put a calendar together specifically um, so you don't have to figure it out from this this is just the outline, but we'll have a calendar that lays out exactly what days or what, but that'll help us consistency with K-12. Um, and another question that somebody asked was whether a student um, that attends BOCES could attend, you know, if they're in a, if they're in a CT program, career technical program, could attend, uh, still attend BOCES virtually if they choose the full virtual model here. That's near impossible to do. The reason being our CT programs and our BOCES programs are really, really hands-on hands -on programs. Um, you can't do electrical work at home. Well, you shouldn't be doing it at home because you're learning and we don't want you to burn your parents' house down. So ha having a student who attends BOCES, we need you to come to school in session with us so that the other half the day um, on that A day or the B day, you can attend um, BOCES. And I believe our seniors go in the morning and our juniors head off in the afternoon. I believe so. Don't hold me to that. We've got to check. 
Um, but that, that will help out with that, that piece there. Um, so our BOCES students, we're thinking about you. We're proud of all the work you do. And um, we want to make sure you get your, your learning in so you can uh, come out with some really awesome skills because we surely need them. Let's see, cohorts, another stack here. So you know, one of the type questions is, if a, will teachers stay with their cohorts during virtual and in-person learning, or will the kids have a different teacher in school than online? So what we're trying to do with the cohorts, if, you're, if a student ends up in a virtual cohort, they will have their teacher in the virtual cohort the entire time. Um, so if we have, let's say across the district, let's use second grade. Say across the district, we have 25 kids across the district in second grade that want to go virtual. We'll have a teacher specifically assigned to those 25 kids for the virtual classroom. So those, those students that come to school on either cohort one or cohort two, they will have an assigned teacher. And that teacher will be their teacher whether they're in school that day or on their remote learning days. It will stay the same. Um, so that's why we really need people to once the survey is complete, and we have tons of feedback from the survey, uh, we have about like a 70% uh, response rate on our survey, which is, if you know anything about surveys, that's, that's awesome. But we still, that still means we have about 1,500 kids we don't have accounted for in the survey. So please fill it out if you haven't already, and please tell your neighbors as well. Phone calls are coming home too, so please, please get us the information. That's an initial information. Right now, about 20% of the survey results say they want to be full virtual. That will help us form who is in who is in what classes. Um, another question comes up about, you know, will students be taught new content during virtual class times? Or will they be getting new material twice a week? All the learning will be new. Um, now that we've had summer and we're able to work out kinks and the surprise that we had in March through the rest of the school year, um, I am blown away by what our teachers and principals and, and our educators have been doing professional learning wise to go from not being comfortable in that environment to diving in. It's, it, it's unbelievable. It's, it's simply unbelievable. And I think the things that all of us are learning during this time will keep using the best practices that we're learning to help all students going forward in the classroom. Um, so same teacher, yep, okay, uh, Google Classroom. Is there a platform besides Google Classroom? There are, but Google Classroom can be as high quality as it's created to be high quality. So that's really on you know, our professional educators to, to do that as much as possible. And they are working together um, in teams. They're working with a curriculum department, their standard leaders, all that work is going on. So that when we start in September, we're in a much better spot than we were in the surprise move in March. Um, you know, one day on a Sunday, we decided to close. We had a staff day on a Monday and then we were closed and back to virtual middle school students. I'll mention this later. If your stuff is still there, you'll be able to get it soon. Mr. Sikorsky will allow that. So that tells you how quickly we had to change, change models. So there will be new content. Um, same question. So, you know, this parent's done a great job asking multiple questions in the same category. Um, Will teachers record the lessons so the students who are not able to log on at a specific time can watch and catch up at a different time? Um, that is an individual teacher choice. Um, I think it's a very good idea to record those pieces. Um, I know there's many teachers that are recording lessons ahead of time. You know, they can find ones online, but we, we have so many that want to make sure that their kids hear their voices when they're, when they're learning uh, material. And uh, that takes tons of time. And it's a scary thing to sit in front of a camera and just talk to a camera like I'm doing now. So I give them tons of credit to do so. Um, and then another question came about cohorts. What if I have multiple children or are there are multiple buildings? Well, the way the cohorts, students will be assigned to cohorts, will kind of use the alphabet as much as possible, the A through L, M through the 50% mark kind of splits the Ls. But once we find out how many students are going to be virtual, we can then look at the alphabet, split them up. If there's households where you know, there's students that have different last names, um, we'll make accommodations to make sure that families are together. Um, if families want their kids split up over different cohorts, we can do that too. But that will come down to making sure your, 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 your building principal knows that. 
because the building principals are constantly working on these cohorts right now, trying to figure out who goes with what. You know, they have ideas of who, who's going to be what teachers, um, but those are being changed regularly as we get more and more information from who's going virtual and who's not, who may, who's able to come back, who isn't. So there's, there's a lot of information that's going to go into this going forward. But the, the notification for what cohort your child is in um, will come from the billing level. Let's see if I missed anything on that group. All right, well, let's talk virtual. Um, there's a bunch of them here. Um, so right now, as I said, we have about a 70% response rate. And so the, the survey that's out through tomorrow or I think Friday morning um, is to give us an idea of who is interested in a virtual. So let's first off discuss the definition of homeschool versus virtual. So if, if a parent decides to homeschool their child, they basically put a plan into the district office. Um, this is Lysing in the curriculum office. They send us a plan and all the learning is up to them. They decide on the curriculum, decide on those pieces. The virtual cohort we're talking about is not a homeschool cohort. It may happen at home, but all the learning will be provided by our teachers and follow through and assessment and grades and all those pieces will be provided by our our educators. So there's definitely a difference between homeschool and virtual. Virtual, you're, you're, you're a falcon every single day and you're learning from our teachers and our wonderful educators here. If you're homeschool, your parents are taking on that monumental, monumental task uh, of, of doing so. Uh, so that's where that kind of changes. Um, and the survey is to get an idea. So when we're gonna follow it up with another information piece so if anybody mentioned they might want to do virtual, um, we'll push it out and we're asking for a commitment. So some parents have asked, well, if I commit to hybrid, can I ever switch my child to virtual? That, that's a yes, we can do that. But we need to know definitely who's planning on doing virtual. So if you commit to virtual in the next round of um, information that comes out early next week or late Friday, what we're asking is you're committing for the semester. So when we say semester, that means um, the, the half, the 20 week mark of when we get back, um, it's the very end of January, usually the last week of January starts the second semester. So you're basically committing to virtual learning there. But if you start virtually, you have to stay virtual because we've done all the laying out of teachers and such based on capacity, staffing and things like that. If you start a hybrid and wanna to move to virtual, that's a possibility. So if you get into the buildings and you just don't feel that it's, it's the right fit, you can still move to the virtual that way. Um, we do have remote learning specifics coming out. Um, as I kind of mentioned before, there's gonna be learning where everybody's together um, virtually. And then there's gonna be other times where there's an assignments and videos and things like that to, to follow up on. So that's asynchronous. Um, this, there will be a daily schedule for virtual learning. So it'll be a, a schedule that uh, you know our virtual teachers will follow. They're, they're, we're asking our students to follow and commit to and um, do those pieces. So um, those specifics will be coming out on Friday. Um, the draft that I got from our, from our awesome educators, our curriculum office and our principals is, is fabulous, um, but they're gonna set a daily schedule. It won't be individual teacher based. If you're virtual learning, you will have a set schedule um, in that virtual learning. Um, another question that came up and related to that, if I have a student that has IEP or related services, whether it's OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, are those services still provided? Yes, they are. They are still, still um, provided. Um, we'll work with each individual family with, with our uh, special programs office and our buildings to make sure uh, those services are still going on. Is it more difficult to provide those services in a virtual environment? It is, um, but that's why we wanna make sure parents have the option to go virtual um, for whatever reason that, that's, um, that's important to their family. So I think I hit most of those. Uh, let's talk about what special consideration means. Um, so special consideration is listed on our chart as being every day. 
Um, right now it becomes cohort three. I think it was cohort four before. Um, so special consideration. In all honesty, um, I want everybody back. I want every single one of our kids back in our buildings. Um, and there's not a day that goes by that I'm not thinking about our kids not being here. Um, I see it with my own four at home. I see it with our kids in the neighborhoods, um, the stories that parents share um, on top of my list right here. Um, the, the stories you all shared in your emails, um, I can sense your frustration, but I can also sense your worry. And, um, you know, the, the, I won't say a last name on here, but I'll, I'll mention, you know, Jody, if you're watching tonight, um, you and other ones that I read through every single one of these emails, including the ones that came in, you know, later today, um, they touch me. Um, it makes it more so that I just want everybody to be back. So our kids can be here and our staff can be here and our families can go back to having some kind of normalcy in our lives. Um, but what I do know is our frontier community is an unbelievably strong community and we will get through this and we will be better coming out of it on the other side. So with the special consideration piece, um, that will, how many choose virtual will help us determine that, how many can actually fit under that category. We're gonna prioritize you know, our at-risk populations, whether it's special ed, um, our English language learners, um, students that are at risk, um, that will include some you know, essential, essential employees, and we'll have to figure out what that, what that truly means, and we'll have to look at these all by a case-by-case -case basis. And I wish we could get everybody to answer right now of what cohort you fall into, but we wanna make sure we get this right for September um, versus constantly changing what we're doing uh, we want to get it right for September so that we have the availability if things get better, if New York stays in the, in the, the space they're in and uh, our Western New York stays in the space we're in and uh, we're, we're ready to come back to school, uh, that everybody that can come back to school comes back to school full time. So um, I wish I had more answers for you, but people that are you know students that will be marked in special consideration, those will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Our principals are going to be helping out with, with those pieces. Our special programs office will be helping out with that. Our curriculum office will be helping out with that. So um, more information is going to come. Um, if we have 50% that say they want to do virtual learning, we have the staffing and the space capacity to do 50%. If we have if we only have 50% doing virtual, that means the other 50% come back every day. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to get all of you back here as much as as many days as we possibly can. So what about those days where we can't get everybody back or where um, child care needs are? So previously uh, we had a before and after school program, but the before and after school program ran separately, even though the district hosted it, it's not funded by the district. It's a, it was a self-sustaining program. So we've moved to right at school providing that. Um, we've updated some numbers and we'll get those out to you in a chart and a presentation at the next board meeting. Um, but there is information on our website. If you go to our website on the top bar and it says community and under that says before and after, if you click on that, that shows you information for right at school. So one of the questions people asked were, well, if you're having daycare on site or child care on site, why can't we just have more kids attend school? So there's two different versions going here. Right at school is going to run that for us, and they will be using our buildings. But the after school component, component for students who attended that day will still be on site. So if I'm a student that attends Monday and Thursday, and I'm at school on Monday, the child care for after school or before school will be at that same building on Monday and Thursday. If I'm attending Monday and Thursday, but it's a Tuesday, the child care, the right at school piece will not be in the same building. We are looking at uh, working through a couple sites outside of our buildings, uh, local, local, local uh, buildings to do that. So that's where we can still keep the capacity down, but have other sites that will host the child care pieces. Um, and because right at, whether it's us or right at school, Anybody that does a child care piece has to get approved by New York State to do so. 
and uh, they're going through that process right now, multiple options to do so, so that we can um, meet that capacity. And they'll work to hire as many people as they need to, including you know, some of our, our former staff and anybody who's interested to do so. Um, one person did ask about, well, how can, how can uh, daycares and private schools do these kind of, do things differently than schools can? They don't have to follow the same guidelines, especially the private schools. Um, they did not have to submit plans to SED for reopening the, or the Department of Health. So that's where there's, there's a difference there. I wish there wasn't, but there's definitely a difference. Um, and then we come to child care when it relates to essential workers. Um, we, will, we are working through what that will look like for essential workers um, to be able to provide that um, for certain essential workers, uh, such as healthcare workers and such, um, that must be provided. Um, and we'll work through those kind of pieces. Um, I wish we had an answer for everybody right now, what days, where, all those kind of pieces. But as the um, guidelines and the rules kind of change at the state level, we're having to adapt to those uh, very quickly. So let's talk transportation. So I'm sure that's on everybody's mind, those yellow buses that uh, we love to see uh, because we know our kids are gonna be off to school um, and then coming back at the end of the day um, and our drivers do a wonderful job of, of keeping our kids safe. So what's that gonna look like this year? Um, so that survey we sent out is giving us information on how many parents need the buses for transportation. A lot of parents said we're gonna pick up and drop off. Some parents have said, I'll be able to, excuse me, I'll be able to drop them off, but I can't pick them up. Or we, can, we, can, we can't we can drop them off, but we can pick them up. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to get and we'll follow up with that same kind of commitment from parents. And we know that can change, but by having that commitment, we're looking at probably about 40% right now based on the survey, less than 40% saying they need transportation. Well, that changes a lot of numbers. So what we're looking at is, you know, our buses, are going to be routed all new, new routes across the board. So if you had 60 kids on your bus, like like mine rode to, um, and rode to Pinehurst, we're not going to have 60 kids on a bus. It's probably 20 to 25. Now the reason I say 20 to 25, basically it's one kid to a seat, spread out against the windows. They have to wear a mask while they're on the bus. If a student comes to get on the bus without a mask, they'll be given a mask. Um, I do suggest to parents. Get masks, buy the masks yourself that are comfortable for your children. Um, my son's not gonna wear the same mask as his soon to be first grade um, sister. Their heads are just different sizes. Hers is bigger, I'm no, just kidding. Um, so the bus piece is, you know, we're gonna do new routes. We may stagger our buildings. Um, most likely our elementaries will stagger to the beginning of the day because that's where we have the most kids riding buses. And that will allow us, our elementary kids, to not have to wait to, for middle school, high school. Um, in the survey, about 75% of parents said they were fine with us changing schedules. We may, we may not. We're going to try to firm that up over the next week once we have those commitments and do this as quickly as we can so we can firm that up. Um, so the new routes, we may have, you know, two elementary buildings start at the same time, one south, one north. And then two others start a little bit half an hour later so our bus can go out with picking up less kids come back and go back out get the next round and come back and, and you know do some of that cleaning and stuff in between and those kind of pieces so um i think our, our transportation department has a really good plan um, we are working on the temperature check issue um, and i'll get to that a little bit later um that we we're, we're really need to rely on the parents to do those kind of pieces um, otherwise, it will take forever to get our kids on the buses and in the buildings. So we'll talk about that again a little bit later. So that's what the bus routes look like, and they're going to be brand new routes. We're going to re we we're remapping everything in multiple different ways to figure out how to make this work best for our kids and our families. So another question that related to that was very specific. Uh, but what hours will students be attending? So right now, our school days are between six and a half and seven hours. We're likely going to be a six hour day um, uh, at all of our buildings. So we're going to kind of shorten it a little bit. Um, 
we want to give our teachers also time at the end of the day to work together to make those those calls and check in on students that were remote learning that day those kind of pieces and by also pushing it together maybe doing more kind of blockish um, you know putting students in more blocks then we can lessen movement in the buildings and as we know the more movement there is the more chances of of a, of a contact uh, with COVID. Um, again, I said, you know, elementary school is likely going to be our first pickup over the next week. We should be able to firm that up. Um, and we want to make the transition with our buses as smooth as possible and make those hours um, as meaningful as possible. So one of one high school student asked me this and uh, I got to follow up with this because it makes sense. You know, if I have a study hall um, at the end of the day, can I leave early? Yep, we do that now. If a student has study halls to start the day or in their day, and that's what's on their schedule, they can come late arrival or early dismissal. That's already a possibility. We have students that take advantage of that and either do internships, work a job, whatever the case may be. So that's that's an option too. So that's another reason we're, we're looking to adjust this to provide some additional options um, to our students. Um, and even some parents chimed in that if we're going to do that, please have the older kids later because um, they need more sleep than the younger kids. Um, I don't think mine at home like the idea of getting up earlier, but um, they will be if that's what we do. So let's see, drop off and pick up. So we're going to have designated entrances just for the bus traffic, and we'll have designated drop off spots and pick up spots for um for for parents or who's whoever's bringing them in parents we're asking we're really requiring don't get out of the car okay um pull up to, to where that spot's going to be you know as we look at the new middle school layout if you haven't driven past lately a lot of a lot of paving's been going on over there so right up along the school on the side there pull up right along the curve as an example and that's where you know little johnny or sally get out of the car Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, whoever's dropping them off, stay in the car and they can go into one of the two side entrances there um, that will keep them separate from the entrances that the uh, bus traffic comes into. So we're going to be doing that every single building and that's why we want to vary the times a little bit more so we can uh, make that uh, easier. Um, I think this is a junior that asked me this. Um, so we got an 11th grader asking a question on this. Um, and the question was, if I'm a junior, am I going to be allowed to drive to school? So if we're going half capacity, and right now seniors are the only ones that are allowed to drive to school, it looks like we're going to have a lot of extra parking lot spaces available comparatively to the normal day. So if we don't have 1,400 kids attending, we have 700. It makes sense that we'll have parking spots, more parking spots available on a daily basis. Um, all driving permits will have to, still has to go through the high school office. So that is going to be a, a finally a high school decision, but most likely juniors and seniors, both of you and seniors don't get upset by this. Juniors are going to be able to drive. And the reason is pandemic. If you were a junior last year and we were doing this stuff like this is, you would have got this privilege too. And I know there's a few of you out there that may have drove to school as juniors. So we'll take care of that stuff. Um, that takes care of that piece. Let's see, uh, temperature checks. So, so here's a screening piece, whether it's getting on the bus, whether it's um, coming into school. Um, I gotta say this first and foremost, most of you know who are nurses because they're the first contact that you get when you know your child is not feeling well. Um, and uh, our, our, our nurse crew is, is absolutely outstanding. Um, the respect I have for them, I, I don't know if I can understate it or, or overstate it really. We, some of our nurses during this pandemic have been in COVID units. They've been out doing work to, to help their fellow community members um, and I'm just blown away by it. So leaning on them, um, the, the, the system they use is called Health Master um, for all the records and things that we have. Well, Health Master has an app that we're working to get access to that will, on a daily basis,
push out to every single parent, faculty and staff member to ask you the questions. Have you had any symptoms? Have you had a fever? Have you, and if you if you hit the right, if you answer those correctly, when you're done with them, and they give you a green, maybe it's a thumbs up, maybe it's an OK sign. I'm not sure which. Um, if you answer those, any that makes us have to go, well, we got to ask some follow up questions. It'll give you an X, it'll turn red, um, those kind of pieces. So like most school districts, we really, really need parents and guardians to, if a student's not feeling well at all, or has any, even if it's a, you think it's just a sniffles and they have a little bit of a temperature, or like, don't send them to school. Um, those, those times of in the past, like, well, I think it's okay. Their tummy was just a little upset. Um, we can't take that chance um, at this point. It's better to be safe than um, possibly have uh, the virus spread the virus. Um, so somebody did ask, you know, the temperature checks at home. Yep. Uh, what about staff and faculty? Well, right now we already have staff and faculty completing a form every day. We're going to be moving to the app daily as well. Um, every day I come to work, I got to fill it out. And uh, my secretary looks at it to make sure I'm checking things. If I check anything that says yes on it or answers things the other way that gives her an idea that I might have a symptom, then, you know, she tells everybody else. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. So she checks my sheet every day and we're doing that for everybody in our departments and offices. So we'll be doing that with our staff faculty as well. We want to make sure we open hybrid wise and we want to hopefully get back to everybody being back ASAP. Uh, let's see masks. So I already got like 20 topics left. Um, so if you need a snack, go for it. Um, so masks, we do have a supply. Um, and we will constantly refill that supply as we go. Um, I do recommend getting your child their own masks because it's a comfort piece. As I said earlier, if it doesn't feel right on, on their face um, and on their ears or the full mask that go around, then it's going to be a distraction for them. Um, their masks are required throughout the day. Um, there will be about five minute breaks you know, per hour and things like that. And teachers are going to be able to stagger who has them on, who has them off, um, social distance wide, but they are required. They, we have to wear them on the bus. Um, somebody asked if, what if there's a face shield? Is that acceptable? You can wear a face shield, but you still have to wear a mask. The only time a student can't, doesn't have to wear a mask, if they have a medical note stating um, they can't, you know, maybe they have an asthmatic condition or some other condition um, that, that, a mask could exacerbate that and we don't want that to happen. And the question then comes up like, well, what if a student refuses to? Um, well, we have a code of conduct for that. We have to take care of each other and we know students are going to be students, but you know, we don't give them enough credit. We don't give them enough credit for, you know, a two year old. I was in the store the other day and as he was, as he was getting close to coming into the door, you see him put his mask on. And I'm just kind of watching because I thought it was cute. Um, it's like, wow, he, mom and dad didn't tell him he had to put the mask on. He put it on, walked off, and never saw him play with it. Other kids are going to be pulling. Um, but we don't give our kids enough credit that if we expect them um, to, to follow through and do these things, if we have the expectation there, we model it, they'll do so. Um, they're, 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 they're much smarter than what we give credit for. And they're really flexible. And I don't mean bendy. Um, I mean, they learn things quicker than we give them credit for. Um, and they're willing to adjust in ways that as adults, it's difficult for us to, it just is. So if a student doesn't follow the rules, it's, it's insubordination in our code of conduct. We don't need to change our code of conduct because it's insubordination. And I did have somebody ask me a similar question that said, well, what if a student um, uses their camera on uh, a Google Meet or something like that inappropriately or misuses the technology? That also is a code of conduct violation. Um, and they can lose the technology. Um, there's a lot of other things that can happen. So um, as long as we know, as long as it's brought to our attention, we'll tackle that. So please, please, please um, follow the rules. 
if any year, please do it this year. All right, let's talk ventilation. Um, you know, somebody mentioned that schools have very little ventilation built in. Well, in reality, we have more ventilation than most buildings. Schools have to re have to change out their air so much per hour. Um, so that's why we have you know unit ventilators in every single room. Uh, we don't have air conditioning in every single room, even though many of our students and staff may have asked for it. It's kind of expensive, twenty five thousand dollars a room to really do it per New York State standards. Um, so we the ventilation is there. Um, we have required airflow. We are going to have the windows and doors open at as much as we can, doors to the classroom and windows to the classroom, because that change of air from the outside uh, that that dilutes any possible virus is going to have a better impact than the air that's in, internally. And that includes use of fans, all those kind of pieces. And uh, I think we have a lot of a lot of our teachers and stuff already have fans in the room. Um, so that would be a great thing to use. Um, Somebody, somebody asked about outdoor learning. Uh, will students and teachers be using the outdoors? Yep, as much as we can. If the weather's good and it's not snowing in October, I'm serious, hope it's not snowing in October, uh, we'll be outdoors as much as possible. Um, and teachers have been asked, can we take our classes out, outdoors? Yeah, definitely. Those are the kind of things that we, we want our kids to do normally, even without the, the, the current state of uh, the pandemic that we're in. Um, another question came in about filters, um, HEPA and MERV filters. Uh, we've looked into those filters. Our, our current univentilators cannot handle those. Um, if we put those filters on, they would burn down in no time. Um, and there's no way for us to retrofit all those um, to do so. Um, it would take multiple capital projects for us to, to do so. So, you know, doing the right thing, having masks on, socially distant, temperature checks before you come in, come to school, um, keeping, you know, our air flowing as much as possible. Those are the things that are going to help. Just like if you're, you know, going out uh, for a meal uh, or going to the store and things like that. Those are the things that will help, things that we're going to do in school as well. Um, cleaning. So let's talk cleaning a little bit. Um, question about hand sanitizer. Um, somebody even wrote, I prefer old fashioned hand washing. We don't want hand washing, not old fashioned. Um, it's the best thing we can do. Soap and water by far is the best thing to do. Even if I went to wipe this table down with, you know, Clorox wipe or whatever, hand, soap and water is still the best thing to, to wipe that virus out or to any germs that are there. So, you know, any chance we have, birthday song, you know, keep, get the, keep those hands clean. Um, you know, the chemicals that we use um, are all approved by guidelines for limiting the virus and also for health purposes. So we're not using anything caustic, cancer causing, any of those kind of pieces. Um, the, some of the devices we're using, it's pretty cool what's come out out of all this being a former scientist, but it's a spray that basically adheres itself to any surfaces, and then within a minute, besides killing everything on the surface, it dissolves. And when I say dissolves, it turns into carbon dioxide and oxygen, and it's gone. So, you know, our, our custodians have already been using that with great results. So those are the kind of things that, that we have available to do so. Um, as far as hand sanitizer, the, the hand sanitizer the district does have is approved. Um, as we've seen in the news, there's over 100 plus hand sanitizers that have the wrong alcohol in it. Um, methanol, as a former chemist, is not good for your body. Um, it soaks into your skin. Wood alcohol, not good. Um, you can go blind from it and die pretty readily from it. Uh, but the hand sanitizer we do have, it's all approved, meets all the criteria. We cannot have hand sanitizer on the buses. It is flammable, and flammable objects are not allowed Flammable propellants are not allowed on our school buses. We are not allowed to change, as per Department of Transportation, we are not allowed to change or put barriers up on our buses. So putting a um, polycarbonate barrier on the bus, we can't do that. Even though we'd love to do so to help our drivers, we can't do that. There would be a violation of DOT rules 
Um, and so far they haven't relaxed those at all. Uh, one thing we are doing, if you look at our board agenda that comes out, I think tomorrow, um, we have a, we're expanding hours for our cleaners. We're adding additional cleaners during the day and the afternoon. So we can do all the high contact places during the day and do that cleaning every single night to make sure, you know, what the next day when people come in, it's just like we started fresh uh, with the school year. Uh, the true deep cleaning happens over the summer, um, you know, waxing floors and things like that. We may not get to waxing floors this year. Um, those are the kind of things that really aren't a priority right now. We want to make sure our facilities are safe for all of your return. Um, and that goes back to, you know, some people said, well, why, why the cohort piece of being instead of AA and then a remote deep cleaning day and then BB? Well, Wednesday is not a deep cleaning day. We're cleaning every single day. So there's not a difference between if A and B goes on Monday, Tuesday, those students are not going to be exposed to anything different than on any other day because we're cleaning with all the same materials during the day and after hours. So that's where, you know, Wednesday is not a deep cleaning day. I think some, some of us have used that language in the past, the superintendents, and all of us regret that because it makes it sound like we have to have one day to clean and we're not going to clean the rest of the time. Our people clean constantly. Our facilities are, are very well maintained. They may be older and there's things we want to do to them to, to improve them, but our facilities are unbelievably maintained by our crews. So if I can re reaffirm anything, wash your hands, wash your hands. So testing and contact tracing. So this is this has become a little bit of a um, hot topic um, since the governor mentioned this uh, a little over a week ago. And um, so for testing purposes, um, I know some people have seen that we were going to we have a contract that will be going to the board next week with mobile primary care. We've been using them for some telemedicine, uh, um, psychiatric telemedicine, and also medical telemedicine at the middle schools. So we've been working with them for almost two years now and working on this model. Um, they are the only ones that have their own testing source. They've, they've contracted with a company to do testing. Now, when I say testing, this is not, does not mean that we're going to test our students and, and faculty at all. Doesn't mean we're going to walk into a classroom and say, all right, all of you, let's go get a test. I got a cotton swab, we're going to test you. That's not it at all. There's no random testing. We're not going to force everybody to have a test before they come to school. Our job is not to test. Our job is to teach and learn. Um, so if a student has any symptoms, we're asking that you know teachers and staff and such do not just let students go wherever or don't send them to the office if they just have a little bit of a belly ache. They need to, they're going to contact the nurse and say, so-and-so isn't feeling well. Um, can I send them down? Whether if it's a younger student or an older student, we may have somebody get them directly and keep socially distant and walk down with them. And that's where we're relying on our nurses, our awesome medical professionals to lay out specifics on how we do these things. So if somebody presents with, with symptoms, we have an isolation room. We're identifying those rooms in each, in each building. Now, isolation means, when I hear that word, it means alone, separate. So if a two or three students aren't feeling well at the same time, for whatever reason, um, I may have got some stomach jitters when I was in school if I had an English test, um, especially with Mr. Parker back in the day. Um, it means they're going to be separated. They're, somebody that has a, that's not feeling well, we're not going to put them all in the same room. That, that would be just, it's dumb, to, to put it bluntly. Um, so there's isolation rooms, nobody will be in the room with them. Our nurses, as I said, many of them have worked um, in the health profession for, for quite a while. They've been doing other things during the pandemic to help out the community, including in the COVID unit. Um, so we're gonna rely on them to make sure all this is where it needs to be, including our, our medical director, Don Springer. Um, what the partnership with mobile primary care allows us, it lets us have direct contact to physicians, district physicians for our staff and for our students. Now, understanding that no test or anything is being done without parents signing forms and granting permission to do so. And if a, if a telemedicine call needs to be made and we have those permissions, 
the parent can be on the telemedicine call at the same time because what the nurse can do in their PPE um, coverage uh, with that student can go through the symptoms, why the parent's even on their phone, um, and go through those symptoms and see if it's really a, co a possible COVID symptom or not, and let a medical professional, a doctor or nurse practitioner diagnose and say, yeah, we need to get them testing. Now the testing aspect, um, you know, some of you may know that uh, I mentioned the paper here and there that, um, you know, I had a case of, of COVID at the end of March into, into early April, was quarantined in my house in the bedroom. Um, I was miserable, but I was lucky compared to, to many other people out there. Um, when I called my doctor, my doctor said, well, don't come in. Here's our phone number. If you need anything else or your symptoms are getting worse, please contact this number. And then on a daily basis, a couple times a day, somebody from their COVID, from the COVID unit contacts you to make sure my symptoms were, you know, my breathing was okay and those kind of pieces. If somebody has symptoms, your primary care doctors do not want you to come into the office. They will send you to an Erie County Department of Health COVID testing site. So the same thing would happen when anybody has, has this issue in schools they will be sent to an Erie County Department of Health testing site. The difference with Frontier is we have availability to take a sample then and there, um, get it, get the sample set, set out, get it tested and turned around within 48 hours. Um, so, but that all has to happen in permission. Our nurses are in charge. And I, I've told our, our crew that, you know, you do what you need to do, and I'll listen to what you have to say, and you tell me what to do, um, because they're the, they're the experts on this and our medical professionals. So um, we are also making two of our nurses lead nurses. We already have a lead nurse, um, uh, Mrs. Brown there, and we'll have our lead nurse for the South. So we're gonna divide our, our district up. So Blaisdell, Big Tree, and the high school are the North, and then Cloverbank, Pinehurst and the middle school of the South. We'll have a lead nurse in North and South. We also have one of our assistant principals acting as a COVID liaison North and South. Um, so I thank, I thank Mrs. Mrs. Thurston and Mrs. Kalinsky for helping um, do that as well. I'm the COVID uh, assessment person uh, to deal with these, these pieces. And we're gonna bring some additional nurses on board. Um, we've, we're looking to uh, some of our retirees and other nurses are willing to come back for a short time to help us out. And uh, I thank them for that. And if you see them when the school year starts, please thank them. Um, so if there's a test, mobile primary or Erie County Department of Health, whatever the case may be, and then that test goes through the contract tracing piece with the Erie County Department of Health. It was very clear with the call with Dr. Burstein on Monday, all superintendents and, and administrators from around the, the county had. And you can see in the Buffalo News, I think the story was yesterday, that contact tracing is the responsibility of the Department of Health. So they will work with us directly. If they get a positive test, they will contact the building principal to inform them who are the positive test and then go through and figure out who may, be, may have been in contact. Now, their definition of contact is being less than six feet from somebody for a minimum of, of 10 minutes. So passing somebody in the hall is not a contact trace. Um, that's why wearing the mask, keeping the socially distant for our capacity purposes is, is really crucial to all this. Um, and there is no random testing. So a lot of people ask like, well, I don't want my kid tested. They're not. We're offering this as an option instead of going to a Department of Health site um, that's available if a child or staff member presents with symptoms, they can choose to have a test done through molar primary care. And honestly, we don't get told um, what the results are. It's a medical piece, it's for them. The only time we get told anything is if we have a positive and uh, the building principal gets that notification. And we can't share who's positive, but we, we would be required to get a list, list of people who may have come in contact with the positive person. So, uh, Hopefully that answers a lot of questions on testing. Uh, we want to do everything we can to keep our people, keep our people and our kids safe and our community safe. Um, lunch, lunches are lunches are there. Um, we'll be having lunch. Um, it's going to look a little different because we got to spread everybody out. Um, 
We're planning on using additional spaces. We're hoping not to use classrooms at all. So the uh, the, the, high, the elementary school is going to be using their not only their cafeteria, but they're looking to also use their stages and auditorium so we can spread our students out. Um, the reason we're not we don't really don't want to use classrooms uh, like some districts are is because some students have allergies. And the other piece is, well, that means we've got to clean an area in addition to what was already there. So we're hoping that's not going to be the case. Um, so our principals are, are knocking that out. Same thing would happen at the middle school, high school. We can vary the schedule a little bit more and do those pieces. Um, and, it's, you know, parents can, of course, you know, send lunch in with their students, but we would have lunch available every day. And I've got to give a huge th double thumbs up to our food service staff who during the during all this, uh, we were serving over 2,000 meals a day. Second in the entire county to only the city of Buffalo. So unbelievable. We kept going with a summer program. Um, it was it was so successful. Other schools are asking if we could help them um, do the food service piece. So for Mr. Whipple and all of our, our crews that work in our cafeterias, um, thank you. I know we're in good hands to start the school year. Um, attendance wise, yes, we got to take attendance every day. Um, we should be, even though it's a requirement, we should be anyways in contact with every kid every single day. So if we're not, there's going to be phone calls. There may be visits home. Um, you know, we haven't heard from you in a couple days. I make sure up at your doorstep because we worry about you. And it's attendance is not to get you in trouble. Attendance is to make sure you're safe and we want you learning as best as we can in, in this this different normal that we have for now, this momentary normal that we have. So yes, attendance is taken on a daily basis, um, including for virtual work. So every day, whether you're in in class, in school, or fully virtual, or just remote on certain days, we're doing attendance. We want to make sure every single one of our Falcons is learning and safe at home. Um, school supplies. Am I allowed to label their school supplies? We're not sharing school supplies. So yes, you can label your child's school supplies. We're not sharing them this year. Um, and I could see, you know, these kind of precautions being the things we make sure we continue doing in the future. No sharing of school supplies is. Um, so that's definitely no sharing of school supplies. Um, somebody asks, uh, will we be required to print material at home? Now that we've had time to get things going, um, no. We don't want anybody having to print stuff at home. If we, if it has to be a worksheet, it can be turned into a digital piece. And we have the availability for, you know, awesome educators that can make that happen in a heartbeat. If somebody's not comfortable doing it or it's not sure, there's a, there's a lot of um, resources at their fingertips. And a lot of people in our district have different ways of doing different things. And we're going to lean on our on all, all of our educators to help each other um, out with these pieces. So you should not be having to print at home. Chromebooks, see how these are going a little quicker now. Um, well, Chromebooks, uh, what grade levels will be eligible for one-to-one -one devices? Every grade level is eligible for one-to-one -one devices. If you have a device at home, laptop, desktop, Chromebook, iPad, please use that. Uh, we have an order in for another 1,000 Chromebooks that would complete our one-to-one -one at the high school. Um, since every other school district is trying to do the same thing, and we were trying to start this one-to-one -one before the pandemic, and others have now jumped into trying to get the one one to one. Um, they're on back order. Let's put it that way. So hopefully they come soon. But if you don't have, that's why the survey has people marking whether they have this or have that. Um, the survey is going to help us so we can get in contact. But if if you if you don't have a device or Wi-Fi or that access, contact your child's building, and they will work with our technology office to do so. We did three rollouts last year of devices. We have things available. We just got to know. Um, and if you contact our, our principals, and if you don't hear from the principals, you know, give give the educational center a buzz. Send me an email. Uh, we have an awesome tech team led by Mr. Sullivan. So uh, we'll make that happen. And if you have an issue with your device, um, again, contact the school building, and they will put you in, put them in contact with our tech team. We're actually looking into office hours for our, our tech team to make that happen. We also have students, um, and I'll give a shout out to Mr. Helmicki, that we had last year, including one of our graduates, um, worked to devise a student tech team. So that's going to be called Flight, and it'll be taking off 
this uh, this year as we get rolling and our students gonna be helping out with those things as well too. So if you have any of those concerns, please just reach out to the building, please. And if you can't, if you don't hear back because all the craziness going on, send it, send an email or phone call my way. Um, any related services, my son receives OT speech and counseling services. Are these gonna be incorporated in the schedule? Yes. So any related services will be scheduled. Uh, buildings will be taken care of along with our special programs office. Um, so let's talk phys ed and music. Um, we are having phys ed music and the arts. They are gonna look different this year. So for music and PE specifically, um, being a former um, trumpet uh, player for some years and choir through college, you know, we blow a lot of hot air. And plus I'm a superintendent, so some of you may think I blow a lot of hot air anyways. So that requires students to be at a distance of 12 feet. But we have an awesome music department that has been working with their colleagues around the county and around the state to come up with ways to do this. We may have smaller groups with fewer students, more like the chamber kind of groups. Uh, we make to go virtual. Um, I know you, you probably, if you hadn't seen, we have some videos out there here and there of what our students were put together virtually together. Just absolutely amazing. It will look different. Um, and, and our phys ed department will be looking different as well too. Um, you know, contact sports, not happening. But uh, maybe there's a little yoga in there and, uh, and uh, some fast fit if you're watching um, and those kind of pieces. But those departments and our art department, they, they're just awesome. And they've been working ideas. And I'm sure we'll see some TikTok videos from uh, one of our phys ed teachers there that I was looking forward to TikTok Tuesdays during the whole pandemic. And I, I, I haven't seen any this summer. So I'm, I'm craving for those TikTok videos from our phys ed department. Um, so we're working on those plans. Um, a lot of our specials may end up being mostly on the remote days, just because to lessen the contact time, but we're gonna do everything we can to, to make that happen, um, including instruments. So if you're gonna be a fourth grader, and that's the year everybody decides what instrument they're gonna play. And I know our instrumental teachers are just clamoring to get, get you soon to be fourth graders going. So stay posted, um, you'll be able to get instruments. Some, many of the lessons may end up being you know, virtual. You may be on video, back and forth, those kind of things. And um, I have no doubt having some of the best departments, especially in the special areas, the art, music, and PE departments, and I would say the best departments around. And uh, you know, I'm willing to battle any other superintendents out there to compare departments. Ours are among the, the very best, not just in the area, but across the state. They have plans that they're working on to help us knock this out. So yes, specials are, are extremely important. Um, we had some questions on, on UPK or pre-K. Um, we, we will follow the same kind of split as K-12 does. The big question right now is grant funding. Our, our, our pre-K funding is fully state funded for the, for the two classes we have at Cloverbank and we also have at Blaisdell. And then we also help fund EduKids spots at Head Start through that grant funding. Um, at the end of every July, the, the um, state tells us what our allotment is for that grant funding every end of July. This year, nothing. I don't mean nothing like total zero, it's crickets. It's extremely quiet. You can hear the crickets, the peepers, and the cicadas creaking in the background. So we're waiting to find out what that looks like. No matter how many times districts have contacted, the response we get is they're waiting on the division of budget. And uh, the division of budget, um, you know, if the federal stimulus funding doesn't come through to the states, we could be looking at, you know, funding cuts for school districts as well, not just UPK. So we want to have UPK or pre-K programs going. We'd love to expand those in the future. Definitely not going to be able to do this year. Once we know about the grant funding, we'll know whether we're running it out. But we're planning to run now. If the grant funding doesn't come through, then you know we'll have to make a decision 
based on whether we can do so or not. Um, kindergarten. So for all you parents, especially those first time about to be kindergarten parents, um, my last one just got done with kindergarten of the four. So I, this, I can't even imagine how stressful this time must be for you. Um, especially with your first one going to school. Um, and I, a number of you wrote me emails and, oh, um, just, just not sure what, what you're going, what we're going to do, or you're going to do and worried about your child's first day. One thing I, I had to give you some bad news. We, we can't let you go to the classroom the first day. We're not letting visitors into the building. Um, and even people that, you know, would normally come in on a daily basis or, or often any visitors to the building are going to have to go through temperature checks and all those kind of pieces. Um, to even enter the building, the visitors that aren't, you know, students and staff and faculty. So those are the kind of things that we'll be doing. So we can't have parents come in. Um, but I know with our four awesome elementary principals, um, they've already done some Zoom meetings and I know they're gonna be doing more of those and we'll, we'll be holding a bunch of virtual kind of orientations. Um, and kindergarten screening this year is not gonna happen in advance. We'll do the kindergarten screening when they come back to school, um, if they're in, if they're, not virtual. If they're virtual, we can work that out with uh, with the building principals um, once we have that list, and um, we'll make it happen. We want those little ones as comfortable as possible coming in, um, and it just bothers me tremendously that their first experience is not what all of our other for all of our experiences were and our other children's experiences were. And the same thing goes goes forth for orientation for the high school. Um, or orientation for fifth grade going into the middle school. Um, I know Mr. Sherrill and Mr. Korski are going to knock that out, and um, it's just going to be different. It's just going to be different. I wish it didn't have to be, but it's going to be different. Some a bunch of people asked about grades, and um, is con is Frontier continuing to follow the pass fail model? Um, this was at the elementary level. Um, we're not going to be following that model anywhere. Now that we've had a chance to, you know, the, the chaos of last year and the device equity and all these other pieces, um, grades will be back in, back in, um, except for those classes that have a pass fail. Um, you know, as an example, I'd love to have more kids take AP and, and college level classes. You can take an AP class pass fail. Challenge yourself. Maybe you never thought of taking one. Now is a great time to take an AP class because. Or, or any of those advanced classes and challenge yourself because you know the test was shortened last year it's most likely going to be shortened again this year or they might not even have it um and the students that did take ap classes the scores we've seen were awesome so you know take that chance push the envelope a little bit um and it looks great on a transcript where no matter what you do after high school um so yes we'll have grades uh, the AP courses, the other thing is um, AP courses, college level courses, all those kind of pieces will follow that cohort one, cohort two, AB kind of piece, just like any other course. So those are available. Um, and honestly, if you're taking a college level AP course and you're meeting two times a week in person and everything else is outside the classroom, that's what college is going to be like. You're not going to have class every day. Um, so it's, a, it's a, maybe a little preamble to that happening. Um, somebody asked uh, if a student decides they no longer want to take an elective because it's not full time in person. Can they now drop the class now that we know it's hybrid? You can always change your schedule. Um, but the one thing I want to caution you on is you need 22 credits to graduate and they need to be in certain areas. So one thing we're going to be working on throughout this year is pathways and creating a digital piece for you to choose your paths and which classes you need if you choose this. Maybe you can choose this instead. So that's something we're going to be working on throughout the year. So it's ready to go for next year's um, course selection. But yes, you can change your electives. You can do those pieces. And again, take some tougher classes. Don't be afraid of that. It's a, we have some really awesome teachers. So please do that. And we're on the last page of notes here. We're almost done. Um, if my child's in high school has a study hall at the end or beginning of the day, can they come in later or leave earlier than the normal school day? Simple yes. We already do that. It's either early, early, uh, early dismissal or late arrival. 
some students take advantage of that and they um, they uh, either do internships or they work a job or any of those kind of pieces. So definitely, that's that's always an option um, to do so. Um, so let's talk some high school, middle school stuff because you know we talked a lot about elementary, but you know students change classes at the high school, middle school skip level a lot more. And we want to limit that movement as much as possible. Um, so the schedule may look a little different at the high school um, than before. Hallways, for example, will be one way. I mean, at the middle school, it's pretty easy. Most of the building's a nice square. So you might have to go all the way around to get to your class that was next to the last class, but we want everybody going in one direction. So there'll be more passing time to do so. At the high school, there might be one-way directions going there too. So um, that will help as well. And we're going to do, the teachers will be moving as much as we, instead of having the students whenever possible. So if we can keep that to a minimum, um, I think it'd be easier at the middle school level just because of, you know, it's not credit based and there's not as much difference in the schedule the students are taking. But at the high school, um, those are the things we're working on. And um, I know our teachers and our, our administrative staff at both those buildings are uh, hot on that topic and, and working on it. Um, middle school pickup. So if you, were, if, if you had a middle school child like this past year, and maybe they're going to ninth grade, or maybe they're going back in the seventh or eighth grade this year. On March 13th was their last day in the building. And since then, they haven't been able to come back and get their stuff. So being a former coach, I worry what's been growing in some of those lockers. Um, but again, we had, the stuff has been there, been safe. And then we had capital projects things going on. So if you've been past the middle school, you see that the front of the building and the side of the building is looking pretty sweet right now. New digital sign up front, those kind of pieces. Well, there's still a lot of work going on inside, but Mr. Sikorsky has been working really, really hard um, and pushing the contractors. We've been helping them push the contractors to make sure that we can get to those spaces. So in the next week or so, Mr. Sikorsky will be, he's put out a couple of tweets and put some messages through Blooms and things like that. Um, we'll be having availability for, for students to come back and get their stuff out of their lockers. Um, so if, if a student's coming back virtual, they'll still be able to get their stuff. If a student's gone into the ninth grade, they'll still be able to get their stuff. Or if they're just coming back from last year and they're moving to seventh or eighth, they'll be able to come back in the next week or so and get their gear. But Mr. Sikorsky is, is the man on that, and he's, he's, he's coordinating that effort. Um, three to go, and I'll let you go for the night. So one question, if we opt for virtual, how will labs be handled? So the Board of Regents approved in the June, um, approved for schools to continue using a, a mix of in-person and virtual labs. So if you choose fully virtual, those labs will still be able to be virtual. Um, there's a lot of things nowadays. When I was a chemistry biology teacher, the technology was not anywhere near where it is. Um, you know, we still use VCR cassettes. So if there's any high school kids watching right now, ask your parents what a VCR cassette is. And you would put the, put the tape in and hit play versus just streaming it on your phone. Um, so virtual, yeah, labs will still continue. Sports, um, sports for the fall, right now the New York State High School, uh, Public High School Athletic Association has put a, said fall sports could start as early as July, excuse me, September 21st. Um, and if that doesn't happen, they're looking to have three shortened seasons starting in January, um, basically, you know, 10 week, eight week seasons for all three, you know, winter, fall, spring. Um, so if a student opts to do virtual until the end of January, will this affect the eligibility to play sports that don't start until March? To play a sport, you have to be a bona fide student. And that means you have to have four, three credits or four credits of high school classes and phys ed. As long as you're meeting those criteria, including virtually, right now they're saying that counts. So I, I expect more information to come, but my question would be if, if you don't feel you can attend in person while the sport's going on, and that sport is somewhat in close proximity, you know, maybe it's not cross country, um, 
how could you feel safe doing the other? So that's just a question you got to ask yourself. But in the end, right now, it looks like that's still a possibility. As we get more information, we'll push more information out. I give Tim Slade and all of Section 6 credit in keeping us updated on this regularly. Uh, and Mr. Gray, I talked to him today. He's He wants to see all you guys and ladies competing again. Um, and I know your parents do, too. And the last one asks about conference days. Um, you know, with federal holidays, the superintendent conference days and half days, you know, a lot of times being a Monday or a Friday, can we change those around? Absolutely. So if we're going to have a holiday or a conference day, we'll change the schedule well in advance. So, you know, Columbus Day is coming up in October. And instead of Columbus, Columbus Day will still be a Monday. We can't change the Monday. But what we can do is change the remote learning day. So take the remote learning day out that week. So Tuesday and Thursday are cohort one or A days. And then Tuesday and then Wednesday and Friday are cohort B, cohort two or cohort B days. So we're going to definitely change those and make that happen. We want to maximize the time we have with our, with our students that are able to attend and hopefully go from a hybrid to a full attendance model. Um, I think that covers all the questions we got. And if there's some very specifics, so here's what I'm going to ask of all of you. Share this video. It'll be up the line soon. Um, if you want to see me go through the last hour and 25 minutes, um, again, you sure can. Um, for the next uh, forum, any new questions you have, or follow-up questions, please send them to the Frontier Forum at FrontierCSD.org. I'm reading every single one of these, and so is our crew. Um, and we're going to knock these out. We won't be able to answer them individually coming back. There's just so many, and many of them say the same thing. But we're going to put a frequently asked questions that's going to finalized to be put out. We're going to put an FAQ sheet out to our, our faculty and staff as well in the by the end of this week or early next week for our staff. And um, anything that we didn't cover or wasn't specific enough, if you send another one in, um, we will cover it on Sunday or Monday or make sure that the right person gets is able to get directly back to you. Because all these questions were wonderful and they really covered all the topics that really are uh, hot topics. So um, I thank you. And um, just know that everybody here at Frontier is doing everything we can to get you back here. Um, as always. Be safe, be well, and uh, see you all soon. Thank you. Tell us when we're clear. Are we clear? Yeah.